more opportunities available. And so a big chunk of what we do is raise money. The other side piece underneath the foundation is the Alumni Association. They are a part of the foundation, um, but they are an entire organization that operates to connect alumni students and other um, partners to the college as well as to each other. So that's all I really have to say. Um, and I am just proud that we get to have an alum come and speak to us tonight. <laughs> So just a few more words before we get started. So again, National Public Health Week is an annual event observed every year in the first week of April to recognize different issues impact, impacting the health of our country, as well as various initiatives and groups working towards improving public health. Uh, this year, we want to focus on workplace safety and sports vision. So I'm going to do a quick overview on some stats about workplace incidents and sports-related injuries, so please stay awake for this. According to the U.S. Department of Labor in 2022, there were an estimated of 2.8 million non-fatal workplace injuries and illnesses and 5,486 workplace fatal injuries. Furthermore, an estimated 20,000 eye injuries occur in the workplace every year. When it comes to sports, Hopkins Medicine estimates that one-third of all injuries during childhood are sports-related, and 21% of all tra traumatic brain injuries are also due to sports. And the American Academy of Ophthalmology estimates that nearly 30,000 sports-related eye injuries are treated in the U.S. emergency room each year. And what's worse is that 90% of all serious eye injuries could have been prevented if appropriate eye protection was worn. So enough with the statistics, thank you for staying awake. Uh, let's move on to the main event. Today, we've invited Dr. Juanita Collier, our own, very own SUNY alumni of 2009. Um, and she's going to do her own introduction as we have here. So without further ado. <laughs> Hi, I'm Juanita Collier. So thank you guys for coming out today. I'm so happy to be here and to be sharing about vision therapy with you. Um, you know, as was said, I graduated in 2009, so that was 15 years ago, which is crazy to me, but I guess that's true. And so here is my family. Um, I opened my practice in 2013, so we celebrated our 10-year anniversary. We do vision therapy only, so it's vision rehab, sports vision, um, visual development, and kind of everything in between. And so here are my little cuties. So the biggest one, that's Rob. And then I have my daughter, Addison, and Justin, and Wesley, and Jade. And before you ask, no, it's not possible to have all four kids smile at a camera at the same time. <laughs> and there is chocolate on at least one of them. So that's my family. I was so happy to come out today because, you know, I'm a suburban mom in Fairfield County, Connecticut. And you guys were like, oh, want to come to Manhattan? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. And then, of course, I got the rainiest, grossest day and stepped in a nice Manhattan puddle and have Manhattan in my shoes right now. And, you know, I was hoping that we'd be at, like, at Ryan Park doing cover tests. But if we're not, we're here, so it's fine, whatever. So, without further ado, let's get right into sports vision. So, when you're looking here, what do these three people have in common? Uh, ooh, I heard it. Can someone say it louder? Yeah, so they're all exotropes, right? And just in case you needed a little reminder, there we go. So, that was a little hint if you guys didn't get it right away. <clears throat> So when we're thinking about sports vision, we probably would not think that exotropes should be able to be as successful as these men are, because we're thinking that you should have perfect binocular vision. And the difference between what I do as a behavioral optometrist and someone who does binocular vision or cares only about binocular vision is that I'm looking to see how a person looks at their environment, how they take information in about space, and how they use that information to inform the way they interact with that space. And then if it's not efficient, then we do vision therapy to work on that. So why does why do they have this advantage or how does this become an advantage for them. And so when we're thinking of predator versus prey, now we're humans, we have our eyes in front of us so that we can have that 
binocular depth protection because what we want to do is we want to be able to go in and kill and eat and get out of there just like the other predators in nature. And then you have my little friend over here, the frog, who has his eyes on the side because what he's doing is he's looking to see if, if danger is coming. And so when we're looking at our athletes, and they have that panoramic viewing that they can use to understand everything that's going on around them. But then when they want to, they can hone it right in and have that appropriate binocular depth perception. So they get that through vision therapy. And as you know, most of the professional athletes do some sort of vision therapy during their conditioning. And so as I said, I am from I live in Connecticut. And my practice is in an in, in even smaller town in Connecticut, and we don't really have any real sports teams in Connecticut. So most of our athletes are student athletes. And so, as you were saying, most of our children, um, or 21% of the childhood concussions are coming from sports. There, we have a lot of kiddos who are doing sports. They start very, very young, and then they go all the way up through the collegiate level, and that's what we see in our office. So when we're looking at sports vision, we kind of break it down into three areas. And so there's visual functioning, so that's the binocular vision piece. So, you know, do you have the appropriate ranges? Do you have depth perception? Can you track? Do you have flexibility for a visual system? And then we do visual enhancement. And so that's when we bring your visual skills up to a competitive level. And that's when we're incorporating things like the fit light and synaptic trainer and, you know, we're having them in their gear and we're going outside and we're doing vision therapy that way. And then we have our concussion rehabilitation. So a lot of our kiddos get concussions and they want to return to play and return to work, at, uh, return to um, school as quickly as possible. So just so I can have like a, an idea, how many people in here are interested in maybe doing vision therapy, joining a vision therapy practice? Referring for vision therapy. Have heard of vision therapy. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Good. Perfect. <laughs> so in my year, there were only like three of us who decided to do vision therapy. So me, who's in private practice, then there's Tammy, um, Dr. Petrosian, and then there's Dr. Jordana. She's still here. Yeah. Yeah. And and Dr. Jordan was here too, right? She's here a day a week in clinic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so those are the three of us from my class, and we're still going strong. So you know, there's hope that you guys will really get into that. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to start with is a kiddo that. So we're going to do a lot of cases because I feel like that's how you can kind of see, you know, the sort of patients that you might be seeing, the sort of changes that you can make in their lives, and also even if you're not going to do vision therapy, the people that you can refer out because you know you can make a really big change in how they um, do the entire life, like the rest of their lives. So we had a ten-year-old who came in, and he was a baseball player, and he was on a travel team. And his coach did not think that he was performing the way that he should. And so he knew that he had the physical skill, but for whatever reason, he wasn't performing at the level that, you know, he could perform at. So he told him that he needed to go get some contacts because he thought it was blurry distance vision and that's what he should do. So this was back when I was at a lens crafter. So that's why I saw him because otherwise, if I was just in private practice vision therapy as a referral only, I would have never seen him. And so for those of you who don't want to do private practice vision therapy, this is the kiddo that he would see first. And so we probe further. He also has difficulties in math and history and all that sort of stuff. So when we look here, he has a blurry distance vision. The coach was right, right? Clear near vision. So when we're looking at these numbers, just kind of like, you know, randomly thinking, what do you think is going on and like what sort of prescription are you thinking that he might need? Mm -hmm. And so what what would you be thinking? Like if you're counting your lines in a quarter after a line, what are you thinking? Yeah, like a day after, maybe a day after and quarter, because you want to give him a little sharper vision for baseball, all right? So we're thinking, okay, he's a simple myo, he just needs some clear vision, let's go. However, this is a vision therapy lecture, and I'm a behavioral optometrist, and this is what I love. So for me, it's like, okay, let's pick up the rock and see what's under it. And here we go. So now, first thing we're seeing is his amps. They're pretty bad for a 10-year-old, right? He has no comedy facility. His near point of conversion is very receded. However, he has depth perception. So when you're thinking about what pre-testing you might want to do on this kiddo, you might say, oh, let's just check depth. That's not really that indicative of anything, right? So then we're seeing that he's 10 exo at near, and then he also failed virgin's facility. 
And then these are his versions ranges. So his base out for distance is abysmal, and for near it's abysmal er. And <laughs> we're seeing like you know this kid is having a lot of difficulty. This is not just a basic myopia thing. So diagnoses, he is CI, AI, accommodative infertility, oculomotor dysfunction, all the things, right? Then we do vision therapy, and he does 32 week, 32 sessions of vision therapy. Then uncorrected, he's now 20, 20 at distance. So most people would have given him some sort of correction for his nearsightedness because most people would not have checked his amps and all of that because, you know, you figure you have 10, 15 minutes for an exam, He's a healthy kiddo. He's he's just blurry. And so you want to make sure that you're looking a little bit deeper and seeing what else is going on. Now his pursuits are smooth. His amp facility, everything's good. MPC to the nose. He's doing great. Coach is very happy because now what's happened is he has become, well, I guess I'm jumping ahead of myself. So then he's, he's very happy. He's doing really well. And he's like, okay, well, we, put, we solved my vision issues. And I heard that a lot of a lot of sports page, um, players do vision therapy in their conditioning. So is that something you can do? I'm like, sure, I'm you that I can do it. So he was my first sports vision patient. And so we did things like the fit light at the office. Um, that that was at my office. Um, let's see. Oh, the wrong direction. That was at my office. This is not at my office. So Steph Curry was not at my office, unfortunately. But then this is back at my office again, doing the synaptic. And with the synaptic, are you guys familiar with the synaptic? Okay, so that's um, technology that was originally designed by Nike. And so what they did, is they saw that there were these 10 areas of visual processing that really set aside people's performance on the field and on the court. And so what they did is they created an entire database where there's not many people who have a synaptic, but there's an entire database that a lot of um, schools have, a lot of professional teams have, and what they do is you put in the person's age, their position, the sports that they play, their position, and their competitive level, and then it ranks them in all of these areas so they can see directly with a little graph as to how they're comparing to everyone else that's playing in their same exact, you know, those their direct competitors. So, we have at our office, we have exercise equipment, so we have an elliptical, we have a rower, and we do vision therapy through moving through space. So then for him, what ended up happening is, oh gosh. So for him, what ended up happening is he became a switch hitter in baseball, and he got an academic scholarship to one of the most prestigious private schools in the state. So then, so that's the visual enhancement. Now we're going to talk about other sports-related concussions. So, a 20-year-old college sophomore who had a concussion, she is an equestrian major at school, and her horse had a heart attack and landed on her head. So then she was in a coma. She, had, she was in the ICU. She was hospitalized for two months. They did PT, OT, speech, but this was a recap center that actually understands vision and appreciates vision. And so they sent her out pretty quickly. So we saw her within two and a half months. So like essentially right when she got out, they sent her to me. And she had, you know, your classic concussion symptoms. So headaches, moving slowly, not feeling like your normal self, all of that. She was not very nice when she came in at all because, you know, when you have a concussion, that's what happens, right? It changes your mood. It changes how you see yourself and how you see yourself at interacting with the world. It also changes how you perceive your future. So for her, she was like, you know, going to be a rock star. She wanted to be um, a therapeutic horse trainer. And now, essentially, she's thinking that her dreams have been slashed forever. So that's how she come, comes into the office. During the concussion, when we're thinking about the visual system, there's a disruption between the ventral and dorsal processing streams. And so the what and the layer no longer communicate appropriately. And then every time the person goes into like a Home Depot or anything like that, everything is so visually overwhelming, they can't understand what's going on around them. And then they're usually a lot more on edge as well. So when we're talking about her visual symptoms, she had a lot. She wasn't able to read for more than 15, 30 minutes. She obviously had to leave school, so she was very excited about that. Her handwriting suffered. Everything just seemed like it wasn't right anymore. She had disturbances in how she was walking, and she just felt like she couldn't think. However, her visual acuity is 20-20. So again, we have these 20-20 people who are complaining about their vision. 
So when you're thinking and you're in your offices and you, or you're in clinic right now and you're thinking about, okay, what are we looking for for this patient? We see that her retinoscopy is plus a quarter, so there's no prescription for her, right? Then we dilate, everything looks good, binocular balance is playing out. And so what are we thinking that we would do for her? So rise or healthy, she's being 2020. What are our thoughts? Some people who like kind of like vision a little bit, like, you know, like more than just the traditional optometric model, they'll say, okay, let's give her some plus in here, right? Give her a half day after plus in here, see if that kind of just helps her do her thing. But if you're thinking about it more behaviorally, you're going to want to look more. I don't think this is going to be. We're going to look more. And so we lift up the rock. What do we see? We see that she's having difficulty with her tracking. She has nystagmus in all gaze except primary gaze. And when she was reading, because I have all of my patients read out loud to me, she skipped and misread a lot of words, and she didn't notice. And so when somebody skips words and they notice, then it's like, okay, they're having some sort of tracking issue, but at least they're paying attention. Now, for her, she didn't notice, and she's a sophomore in college. So we're expecting that she would notice if what she was reading didn't make sense, unless she's used to it not making sense at this point. So then we're looking at her amps. She's six diopters, seven diopters, obviously bad. Accommodated facility is bad. Um, the use cross cylinder is bad. NRIT is bad, all the things. Receded on PC slightly. That perception on this one was receded. But then she started moving both and moving her head, and she was able to get a little bit better than that. But then we see her ranges. So when you have base out ranges at near like that, reading's really, really, really hard. And for her, she was a reader before. So when we look, we have all of her diagnoses, and then we do vision therapy for her. 34 sessions of vision therapy, and she's completely seeing fine, she's not having eye chain anymore, no fatigue, her gait disturbances are gone, she's like actually happy and she's a nice person and she like compliments my ear and was like, oh my goodness, who are you? And so I was like, okay, we, we made a turn here. And then we look and she can read for more than two hours and she can garden for four to six hours. So garden, that's random, right? And so when we're thinking about looking at our patient as a full patient, Success is engaged by what we determine success is. So she did not come in wanting her base out recovery to be better. That's not something that matters to her. What matters to her is that she can garden. So you want to make sure that when you're looking at your patients, you're looking to see what is it exactly that they would like to accomplish and what um, and how will they know that they were successful. Because you're going to have some patients who, if you do vision therapy, they're not going to get up to norm. However, they're going to be really happy. And that's why you want to make sure from the beginning, you know what happy looks like for them. So then, 2015 for distance, everything's good. All the numbers are good. Everything's great. No more in the sadness. And she's good. She went back to school that next year and got right back up on the horse. And I would not have. So to me, that would have been a sign that I'm not for horses, but she thought that horses were still for her, and she's great now. She's so totally happy and living the life that she had imagined for herself before. So when we're thinking about concussions, early intervention is key. And so, as I just saw Dr. Capri on the line, um, you know, so many of the concussion patients have some sort of visual sapella. Usually it's like OMD or something like that. But there's so many things going on that you want to make sure that, that person is being referred right away. Usually what happens is the person will go to their primary care doctor, they'll go to a neurologist, and they'll tell them about their vision issues. They'll say they feel like they're not seeing properly. They'll say that they have double vision, and they'll get referred to vestibular PT. Now, when we're thinking about that, why would that they get referred to vestibular PT instead of optometry? Because most optometrists aren't really caring about vision like that. Like, you know, disease is cool. Disease is, you know, you get to drop people and, like, you know, get all your fancy machines. And vision therapy takes a really, really long time. And you need patient compliance. And patients aren't compliant. And so what's happened is occupational therapy and vestibular physical therapy have taken over vision therapy quite a bit. However, they're not able to use lenses and prisms the, the way that we are. They don't train in the visual system the way that we do. And they're not really getting the quantitative findings that we can get. And so this is an area that you guys have such an opportunity to change lives in. So really, even if you're not going to do vision therapy, make sure you're looking for the things that you can make an appropriate referral. 
So then we have another kiddo. And so she did vision therapy when she was super, super young, and we've just been following her every year. And she was on a travel basketball team, 16 years old. And she got a concussion on the court. She she and another girl's head collided, has collided, and she had very classic concussion symptoms after, so headache, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, cognitive and memory challenges, mental fog, all the good stuff. And um, what was really cool about this one is we know, theoretically, we know that a concussion negatively impacts your visual finding. However, we don't usually have pre-concussive numbers because most of the patients that get, that get referred to me are referred because they have a concussion. They're not coming to me for their general eye care, but they are going to people who are seeing people that kind of on the front lines. You know, I'm a referral practice, so I'm not going to see them beforehand. But for her, she was one that we did have numbers on, so she was still coming for her annuals every year. And if you see in April of 2022, all of her numbers are perfect, her ranges, everything beautiful, no concerns, everything's great, everyone's happy. And then she had her concussion. And so we see that there's a drop in the amps, there's a drop in her depth perception. Now she's ESO at near, and look at her ranges. So this person who was used to, oh, you want me to use my little, okay, there, okay, no, here we go, oh, oh, it's coming. Okay, so when we're thinking about this person who was used to functioning like this, now all of a sudden is functioning like this, how do you think life looks for her? She can no longer read, she can no longer focus, she can no longer play, she doesn't feel safe in her environment, but she's still 2015. So if she had gone and had her eye exam, her she's fine with her contacts, and she has a healthy retina, so no concerns, what do you do with her in that case? A lot of people will say that, okay, just rest and it'll get better with time, right? Just like give yourself a little bit more time. Um, they'll make modifications for school, you know, let's cut down how much she's needing to study. Let's cut down to what her homework is. Let's not have her take tests for right now. Let's just give her visual system a break. Let's give everything a break. But since she had already done vision therapy, she told her pediatrician herself that she needed to come see me because she can't see and I need to make her see. So she came and we did a six week digital program. So at my office, since we do so much concussion work, um, we have patients who travel from all over to come and see us. So we do have digital options as well. So she did a six week course of digital vision therapy. And then we saw her six weeks later, and then look at her numbers here. So when you look at her near version strangers, because those are the ones that we're going to be most concerned with when it comes to academics, she went from her findings right after her concussion to her findings six weeks later. Now her life has been changed again, right? So she's back to normal. Her numbers are actually higher than they were before, and she's happy with the plan. So now she's, so when we're looking like I was saying the modifications that we would make, we could decrease how much she needs to do at school. And then when it goes to returning to play, we have all of these kind of steps that we follow to make sure the person is okay to that. But for her, within six weeks, she was back to everything. She had no restrictions. After two weeks, she was able to practice with the team. And then at four weeks, she was able to play again. So then we are also supposed to be talking about workplace today. So... Workplace concussions. We have a 23 year old um, college student who was working. We we live like so in Connecticut, we have like the naval bases and like rotten and all that stuff. So she was working on submarines and she was cleaning the submarines, she was power washing it. She fell inside the tank 30 feet and she hit everything on her way down, had numerous broken bones. She broke some of her ribs. She was just like a disaster after that. And her life was not going to be the same because she was going for, to school for speech therapy and now she can barely speak. She was just a mess that she kept telling them that her vision was a problem. However, everything else was so much more pressing, obviously, because she had all these broken bones, that vision kind of just got pushed to the wayside. But eventually she, you know, advocated for herself loudly enough and was able to get help. And so she came in with the headaches, sound issues, dizziness, light sound sensitivity, nausea, and she made it a note to tell us that her neighbors think that she's drunk when she's walking her dog because she can't walk in a straight line. So she comes in, her vision, she's 20 20, retina's healthy. What do we do for her? 
So a lot of people would be like, she has bigger fish to fry. She's recovering from everything. She's, you know, she just needs some time or she just needs time. Time is the enemy of concussion rehab provision. We need no time. We need to get them as soon as we possibly can because your brain is going to figure out how to survive. And it can do that in an efficient way or an inefficient way. When we have more time, usually what happens with the healing process is that's an inefficient way that now that person is um, functioning through life. But then, when they finally do get help, we have to make them so much more symptomatic because it's almost like we have to re-break the bone. So we have to get back into that system and however they were compensating for their poor eye movements, however they were compensating for their lack of accommodative ability, however they were compensating for their lack of depth perception, we have to go back in there and re-make that happen again. And so these patients become so symptomatic that a lot of times they quit in the middle. Whereas this is something that could have been fixed right away. Obviously, in her case, she did need to have some surgery. But she came in, she's 2020. She would have gone to her regular eye doctor, been 2020, had a healthy retina, and been told that it's not in your vision. But look under the rock, and what do we see? We see that her amps are horrible. We see that her NRAPR is horrible. Her NPC, 12, 14 inches of time. That's just the third time. So if you're thinking when you're doing, when you're reading for an extended period of time, that's going to be like what, 20, 30 minutes? And she can't do NPC for 10 seconds? So can she, so how is her speech therapy career looking for her at this point? Not great. And now her goal is to be able to walk the dog without the neighbors being concerned. Like that's a complete life change for her. And we have the ability to completely bring her hope back. So then, her diagnoses, you see the diagnoses kind of all are similar after a concussion, right? So we do vision therapy, 34 sessions of vision therapy. Now she can read. She does, she's not getting car sick or headaches anymore. And she can, she went back to school and she was able to actually copy from the board again. She's walking straight. Now, update from here, she's driving and she's back in school for speech therapy. And now she's actually in her master's program. Those are findings. Okay. So then, other things that we're looking at when we're thinking about sports vision. So yes, we have our pediatric sports, um, our pediatric athletes. We have our high school athletes. We have our collegiate athletes. But also, we have our military personnel. And a lot of times, they get overlooked. So many people have the dream of being in the middle of the ferry when they grow up. And they have the dream of what type of branch they're going to be in and everything like that. And so we have a lot of patients, because I said we're, we're located in Connecticut, but we have a lot of patients who want to go into the Navy. Navy's requirements for the specialties are very, very high. So we have a 19-year-old male. He had just graduated from high school. He knew he was going into the Navy. He got accepted into the Navy, but his goal was to be a Navy diver. The depth perception testing for Navy diving is you actually, you essentially have to be like 100% on, on um, work and everything. And so for him, he went, he failed the screening. So then they're like, okay, go to a private doctor, see if they can retest you, see what's going on. And he failed it. And so the doctor that he went to, thankfully, was like, okay, well, you know, there's Dr. Paul here. I don't know if she can do anything for you, but you might as well try. It doesn't hurt you already failed. So we got, we came up with like a really great recommendation, um, sort of referral I love. And we see here are his numbers. So yeah, he is doing really poorly. He does have really bad depth perception. Look at his ranges. Absolutely horrible. And then he is motivated. A motivated BT patient can change the world. He did nine sessions of vision therapy, and then those are his findings. Now he's a baby diver. Nine sessions. So that optometrist could have said, hey, you're 2015. There's nothing we can do. Your depth perception is bad. It is what it is. You're already in the Navy. Just like keep, keep going in that, in that right thing. But for him, no, that's not where he was going to stop. And that's not where his eye doctor stopped either. So then the Navy SEALs, that's even higher requirements for your visual skills. And so we had a 26-year-old male. He was already in the Navy. He was already an officer in the Navy because he went to college first. And then he decided he wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Had the screening, failed depth perception. So they said, go to your private eye doctor. He went to his private eye doctor, and he's like 2015 minus in the right eye. 
and he has, you know, he didn't pass RDF. His depth perception wasn't great, but he had an intermittent um, esotropia. So a consonant distance, intermittent ear. So for him, she was like, you know, maybe we need to correct that right eye. So she gave him a contact for like a minus 0.5. And she was like, okay, maybe that will like kind of help everything go. But just in case it doesn't, there's this doctor, Dr. Collier, heard of her, don't know her. You can try it. You already feel it doesn't matter. I'm like, oh, another one of these great girls. Thank you. But he came, and since he was an actual trope, it took a lot longer. So it was eight weeks that he was in vision therapy, but he had full RDS, full word circles, and his turn was on. So with that, those two eye doctors changed those two patients' lives. So they don't do vision therapy. They referred out for it. And now these two men are able to live their dreams. And so my hope for you guys is that if you're not doing vision therapy yourself, that you at least look for these things that most other eye doctors aren't going to look for, but then you can change the lives of your patients as well. So through vision therapy, we give hope, we provide a space for opportunity, we restore function, and we change lives. Here we go. <laughs> Questions are made about anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm currently taking um, AVSF here, and I was just curious if You're taking what? the AVSF class here to learn like all the techniques used in vision therapy and stuff. I don't know what those letters mean. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> it's like the vision therapy class in second year. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm going to change the Sorry. Okay. <laughs> like, like, okay. <laughs> I'm curious what, like, how it compares to, like, the um, techniques that you learned in school versus, like, the techniques that you use now to get your patients the results that you were telling us. So we're still doing the same, the same things. Okay. And so, you know, I'm still doing MCC, I'm doing AMPS, I'm doing, you know, distance based on base, and I know that back when I was here, you know, it's like, oh, you only text like the compensating range, but you saw for them, it wasn't just their compensating ranges that were reduced. So check everything, you know, all of the tests, like all of the things that make your eye exams right now when you're in clinic, two and a half hours, do those, because then you'll get all the information that you need. We thought what makes it really powerful is for you to remember that your, current, your patient's not clinical findings. It's what does this patient need in order to see the world the way that will be the most efficient, most effective for the life that they want to live. So if you have a kiddo who's having difficulty reading because they're seeing double or they're seeing blurry or the words look like they're moving on the paper, most likely they cannot convey that to their parents because that's how they've always been. So they have nothing to compare it to. They just know reading is hard. And so when you're looking at their numbers and you're like, oh, they have a receipt of MPC, they have four base out ranges, that means nothing to anybody except for real. But when you can actually convey that in a way that the child now agrees with you, now you're, you're helping the child advocate for themselves. And once the child feels heard and seen, then they can do anything. So then they're coming in with like, you know, their A's on their test and they're like, you know, Dr. Potter, look at what I did. And they're so excited about everything. But, you know, it's really just you advocating for the world that they are, the world that they're seeing and understanding that the world they're seeing right now looks very different than the world that is actually in front of them. So then when you're looking at your concussion patients, they're a little bit easier because they know how they used to be, but they know that they're not being that way right now. So when they're going into advocating, they can advocate for themselves because they're comparing a loss. So it's a lot easier to talk about that. However, if you're seeing a patient that's two years out of a concussion, the loss that they're remembering was like this fantasy world that they they um, don't really remember appropriately what they could see before, but they also don't know if they'll ever get back to normal. So then we have to do a lot more, you know, psychology in the therapy room. Whereas, you know, if you see them within like the first six months or so, you can just do the vision therapy. When you're seeing them that far out, then a lot of times they've given up on hope and once hope is gone, it takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I might have missed this in your introduction, but did you do a residency and what was your experience like? If so, or do you recommend doing a residency? 
So I did not do residency. Um, when I graduated, I, I worked for Randy Shulman. So I don't know if you guys have heard of her. So she has residency now, but back when I graduated, she did not have residency. And so when I was considering going to work or doing a residency, she was like, oh, it's working my practice. It'll be like a residency. And then, lo and behold, later it was. Um, so I did not do residency. I started working with her. And at the same time, I started addition therapy at a less crafters at all. So I started addition therapy on my own right away. So I had, I was working for a doctor who kind of allowed me to do whatever I wanted. So I started DT there. And then we um, extended into his other less crafters at a different location. And then we were just, it became so successful that I started my own practice. Other, oh, do I recommend a residency? Um, so when I went to hire a doctor, I wanted a residency trained doctor. So Dr. Strong worked in my office before she moved back here. So, and she's amazing, you know. So I would definitely say the residency's help because she was able to come in and my patients trusted her like right away. Whereas, you know, when I hired another doctor or two other doctors who didn't do a residency, they didn't have that same sort of confidence. So when they saw her and when they saw those other doctors, they were like, oh, but when do I see the real doctor? But they never said that about Dr. Strong, so. It's also part of her personality, but you know, she went into her confidence, so who knows if it was a residency or her or whatever, but she's amazing. Other questions? So how do your patients commonly try to describe what their experience, because um, I, I don't think all of these folks yet have had the opportunity to, you know, see patients, because as you said, children can't necessarily describe it, and there may be a warped personality, but what are some of the words, what are some of the phrases that you most commonly hear for those who are coming to you so that you know to look deeper? Yeah, so for the kids, they a lot of times will say that the words move when they're reading, and usually parents say that they're making it up, so they're saying they just don't want to read, or, you know, also you want to look for symptoms of avoidance, so if a child is choosing not to read, usually or often you can assume that something's difficult about it because for the most part kiddos do want to please and so if everyone else is reading and they seem like they're doing really well at it they're not going to be like oh you know what well i refuse to read because i'm just that cool like no they're going to try and then they're going to fail and then they're going to stop and so a child who's refusing to read or really doesn't want to or things like that like you know we're going to want to look a little bit deeper as to what's going on like I said, they can't report any change. So when they started reading, things were double. When they started reading, things were blurry. But they just know that Timmy next to me sees fine, and I don't. Or Timmy next to me reads fine, and I don't. Or it's taking him for it's taking me forever, and it's taking him no time. And I'm the last person with my paper, so now I'm not going to do my paper anymore, and I'm just going to bounce off the walls instead. When we're looking at our compassion patients, usually they just say like things don't look right. Okay, yeah. More words would be great, but they don't have them. Things don't look right. I can't I can't go to the grocery store. I can't go to Home Depot. I can't go to Lowe's. I can't drive. Or they do drive. And they're like, but when I drive, I have to cover an eye. And it's like, oh, really? That's wonderful. Or like, you know, I, I have really difficult time staying in my lane when I drive. So then I always just drive on the left-hand side. Like, oh, so you're driving the fast lane when you're on the highway because you have trouble staying in your lane. Okay. So these are all things that, you know, but when you do their exams, oftentimes they're 2020. They're 2020 and they have healthy retinas. And so, you know, we have to look a lot deeper. And like I said, neurology has learned to refer to um, the dyspnea of PT instead. Because we're just not, we're, we're not doing it, you know. As far as um, fellows, so the College of Optometrists and Vision Development have, have fellowships. And so there's like five of us in Connecticut. Like, so in the entire state, there's nobody. And so unless you know a guy who knew a guy and they had gone to one of us, then there, there's no one to go to. And so the particular PT and OT kind of have to pick up the balls that we're dropping, but ideally we wouldn't be dropping those balls and more people will go out and get their fellowships and really, you know, take it on because I get to, every day I go to work, I get to change a life. So that's just, you know, an amazing feeling. And what else did you say? Um, what other symptoms do they complain of? So I feel like that's a lot of it. Like, you know, they don't feel like they're normal selves. Everyone, they all have headaches and things like that. So that's pretty common. And um, 
but it's the things that don't really go away. So when they have their headaches, they are, they can tell you where their headaches are. They can tell you, you know, they're not waking up with headaches in the middle of the night. So you can kind of like, you know, think maybe it's more of a visual thing. They'll say that when they're driving home at night, their vision's blurrier than when they're driving to work. They can't sit at the computer for a long period of time. So, you know, a lot of times you have online intake forms and patient can't do it. So, you know, we still have to have our paper intake forms too because they just, they're, it's impossible for them. Or, you know, they'll have somebody come into the exam with them because they're there and they seem like they're totally with it, but they're not absorbing anything that's happening. So they have somebody come with them. So usually we recommend that they do because even if they think that they're with it, thinking of your visual system in this way is just so foreign to essentially everybody that most people think that vision is eyesight and that's about it. But when it comes to vision therapy, eyesight is the least of our concerns, really. It's everything else that you're doing. So we have a lot of patients who are referring to us from Easter Seals. And so they do bright position, um, re they do driver relocation, and also they do driving lessons for kiddos who are on the spectrum and are getting ready to start driving. So most of the time, eyesight's 20 20 but parents are like, I don't know if I trust him on the road. And it's like, you probably shouldn't because, yes, do they have enough depth perception to pass the TMB test, especially if the administrator is nice? Yeah. But do they have the eye hand coordination that they need? Do they have the peripheral awareness that they need? Do they have the central peripheral integration that they need? Like, all of these things that are happening when you're driving, your eyesight is the least of your concerns because if you can't see the car in front of you, that's a way more than a 2020 issue. So we want to make sure that you understand everything that's going on around you at all times and that you can react appropriately. So if you're driving behind somebody and they don't have good figure ground discrimination, they're going to slam on their brakes way too late and now you're going to crash into them. But when we're thinking about eyesight and what the DMV is looking for, they're not looking for your bigger ground discrimination. Then you know what that is, right? So you guys are the ones who know what it is. So you guys are the ones who get to look for it and keep people safe, too. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about your virtual training program and what kind of exercises the patients can do? Oh, yeah. So after COVID, we started a lot of digital training programs because at first we had to do remote vision therapy. And I was very anti that whole situation because I was like, no, vision therapy is one on one in the office. Like, I need to do the vision therapy for them and I will change them. And then when we saw at home, some people did really, really well because yeah, they were in their comfortable environment. They like their parents kind of took it on as their own responsibility as opposed to, I'm going to drop my kid off in the grocery store. And so then we thought, okay, well, we can do some virtual vision therapy, but only for some people and only when it's absolutely necessary. Then we started weightlifting after COVID. So it's like, okay, well, something's better than nothing. So we started a digital program just for our weightlifts. And what we saw, it was a 12-week program just to kind of like get them through somebody graduating. And what we saw was that business was resolved, amblyopia was resolved, double vision's gone, reading levels are going crazy. And we're like, whoa, what, what's, what's happening here? So then it started so that um, it seemed like a better patient care model to start all of our patients between six and nine years old on the digital program and then see if they need vision therapy after. So then once that happened, then our adults heard, and they're like, oh, but like with my concussion, I, sometimes I'm having bad days on the days of my appointment, so then why isn't there a digital program for us? So then we, did, then we developed our digital programs for that, and then we moved to locations to like 20 minutes away, and people act like that's like we moved to a whole other country. So we have to do a digital program for the people who wouldn't travel. And so we have a lot of digital programs at this point. And we don't, it's not like HTS where like they're on the computer. We don't do that. I still am not um, an advocate of having people with vision issues spending more time on the computer. HTS is a great program once they graduated. I do have people do that. But um, all of the exercises are free space. And so the video is on what we want them to do and how we how we um, have planned out how the exercises go, follow the, the normal developmental pattern. And what we do is we're essentially filling in the gaps that were skipped when people are developing their visual systems. And so because now we have a strong foundation, it changes everything with how they function visually. Yes. 
for those of you with a digital program, like how do you get their like data or their progress? Like, do they come in for like a one on one to like get a checkup or do they like, input something in the computer that you can see? Yeah. So for our so for our digital programs, a lot of our patients do come and see me first, but we have other optometrists who are providing the program. So they'll have their exam with their general optometrist who will do the testing and have them do the digital program and they can them back for their readouts. So that was helpful because um, a lot of times you'll refer out for something like vision therapy, retina, whatever you refer out for, and you have no idea if your patient ever went, and you have no idea, you know, what happened, or the patient's like, they said everything was fine. It's like, okay, but can I know more than that? Or with vision therapy, they're like, oh, they said I'm getting better, and there's still no quantitative data with that. And so this way, the optometrist has all of the information themselves, and they're having the first the program. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Do you do on the sports vision at your office? Yes. And then uh, you graduated from SUNY, right? Yes. Because I know we're not big on sports vision here. How did you feel? Like, how did you get yourself ready to go into that? Yeah, so I think that, well, I've done a lot of sports ed and my fellowship and everything, but I think that kind of with everything that I've done, it's like you have one patient that you're like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to help them and see them through it. And then once you're doing that, you're learning so much. So I... And Dr. Wong, back when I, I don't know if he's still here, but he was like, if you're not learning something from every single patient you see, then you failed. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> with VT, it's like you're seeing them so much that you should be learning something every single time that you're, you're encountering them. So, you know, some people are like, VT is so boring. You're just like, look at the broad string. How many strings do you see? How many strings do you see? How many strings do you see? Until you like, you know, lose your mind. But when you're actually looking to see how is that person taking your space, it's like so amazing to kind of transform how you're looking at everything. So I was, I was an athlete. I was a cheerleader from second grade through college, um, which it is a sport, so don't. <laughs> However, I did actually ball sports. And so when it comes to sports vision, it's like you think that, oh, the doctor needs to be like this football player or something like that. That's not me. I did cheer for football in college. Um, in high school, we didn't have a football team. Our, our school was too small. We played soccer, cheer for soccer. That's also very interesting. Um, but anyway, so you don't need to, you know, be a master at the sport, but you do need to know what the different positions are doing and what the visual needs are and what will give them a competitive advantage. So that's kind of how you kind of get into the whole thing. And, you know, we go to practices. So we'll watch them at their practices. We have them practice. In, mm -hmm. We'll have them do vision therapy in their gear. We'll go outside with them. So we'll look at everything to see exactly what they need. But a lot of times the athletes themselves know, like, what they need and what their weaknesses are. There appears to be a question in the chat, maybe. I can read it off if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's from Dr. Steiner. Oh, hi, Dr. Steiner. <laughs> it says, hi, Dr. Collier. Hoping to see you at COBD. Our students hear frequently from people who do not offer vision therapy that they can't make a living doing vision therapy. Could you please confirm that you are <laughs> Be comfortable to keep your office running. I feel like the last time I was here, she asked that question the first time. I guess it's a big thing here. Um, so, vision therapy. January 2023, a lot of things changed with billing for vision therapy. So it's gotten a little bit trickier. Um, however, you can you can get so patients, if they understand, people can afford what they want to afford a lot of times. Okay. And obviously in some situations that's not, that's not the case. And there is the foundation that um helps with vision therapy. I forgot the name of that. The guy who does emergent. He has a foundation. So, you know, they help you, you know, figure out who you should get scholarships to and things like that. So it's very, very helpful too. Because, you know, we do make enough that we can give scholarships to some of our patients, but just to get somebody that they need help doesn't mean they do need help. And then you don't know who should loud versus who actually is in need. And so he does it so that, you know, they actually take in their financial information and they tell you how much of a scholarship you should give. So that's an amazing program because before it was kind of just very, you know, haphazard who would need scholarships to. But when your child is struggling with reading, so right now I have an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a five-year-old, um, because he had two kids and I had two kids and it's a whole mess. But if any of them are struggling with reading, you figure out what you need to figure out. 
So where I'm from in Fairfield County, there's a little bit more disposable income. And so, you know, people do live in Bell, which is $20,000, or you'll do organ dealing him um, therapy, which is thousands and thousands of dollars. There's brain balance, which is $6,000 for 12 weeks. So people will afford what will work. So if you know what you're doing and you're confident in what you're doing and you're changing life, then there's no question as to whether or not you can be successful. If you're doing like, you know, bathroom vision therapy, like in room three with a bra string, then yeah, it's going to be harder to charge for that because you're not like actually giving your full gusto into it. But that's the same thing like what well, corner anything else too, right? If you're going to have to do it, then you're not going to be great at it. Hope that answers the question. Yes. On a similar note, so insurance doesn't really cover vision therapy. Right, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they used to cover it a lot more. So like back when I graduated, they covered it like a hundred percent, and then every year it goes down a little bit more. But um, now they they really don't. They changed the code so that if you're having a therapist do it, you get reimbursed like fifteen dollars something like that. And obviously, you have to your therapist more than that. So it's a it's a whole thing. Um, and they also decrease what you can submit for too so it's easier if you do it not that way because then you can actually really affect change as opposed to like trying to do like a list of exercises that they say you can do and then needing some insurance is required you to do 12 weeks of home therapy first and then like you know before we had the digital program that was the main option because what are you going to have them do for those 12 weeks other than just wait 12 weeks of their life so um yeah but so we do charge self-pay for our vision therapy and it hasn't been a problem However, when we were nervous about it at first, we were very much like, we were getting a lot of no's. So the more that you're coming into it, like, oh, this person's going to say no, the, the more that they are going to say no. And then even people, you know, who don't have insurance, that's, that's great. So, you know, in Connecticut, we have, you know, our Husky patients and that sort of thing. But people still have grandparents. People have grandparents, they have cousins, they have things, they have, you know, foundations, the Lions Club will all give money for things. So there's a lot of ways to get things going. And the goal is to help the kids. And if that's what you're doing, you're going to make money from that. Like, I don't know any behavioral economists that are, you know, not doing well, if that's what they've devoted themselves to. But if you're, like I said, you're doing it on the side, that's going to be a lot harder. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for workplace safety that um, we could share with patients for how to keep their eyes healthy and, of course, avoid any concussions would be a great one, but... Yeah, avoiding the concussions would be great. Well, really, for us, <clears throat> it's making sure that if they're in an environment where there are dangerous things, we're bringing safety goggles because most patients don't wear their safety goggles. So we definitely want to reinforce that. But if there is any sort of injury at work, to make sure that they get evaluated right away. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just go home and sleep it off. And that's not a very good option. So as far as avoiding the concussion, you know, try not to get a concussion. But if you do hit your head, try to get that taken care of because once you get your first concussion, you're much more likely to get other concussions after that. And so we've had, you know, a lot of patients too, they had their first concussion, didn't really fully have it treated, and then they hit their head on a cabinet like five years later, and now they're fully post-concussive syndrome, can't do anything, can't go to work, can't function. So we just want to make sure that, you know, people are getting their visual system rehabilitated as quickly as possible and completely so that then they can be safer when they go back out. Anything else? Okay, great. Thank you guys for watching.